right, hello everybody, and welcome back to the next episode of Test Tubes and Cauldrons. In this particular episode, we are going to be talking about the magic of research, the importance of research, what it is, the different ways to do research, the different kinds of sources people can use for their research, um, how we can vet a source, and a couple of other different topics. But before we get started with that, I'm going to pass it over to Han, who's going to talk about this part of our podcast, which is all about what happened on this particular day, which is February 13th. Okay, so on February 13th in 1912, famous American physicist Robert Millikan collected data from the first drop of his famous oil drop experiment. In this experiment, the charge of an electron was measured by looking at the motion of oil drops within an electric field. This was a vital experiment that earned him the Nobel Prize in 1923 and provided science with a fundamental unit of charge. So cool. I've had a lot of fun looking for this one, um, and I thought it was really, really interesting that this happened on February 13th. It's so funny how random days that you think are so unimportant, something amazing has happened. Oh, so cool. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and just get into it. This is going to be kind of a long episode, so hang in there with us. Um, we have a lot to cover, lots of different opinions and takes on this topic. So to start, let's talk about what research is, what form research often takes, and why research is important. Um, today, we are kind of going to look at this from both a scientific and a cult point of view, so you'll kind of hear us intermixing the two fairly often, so just keep that in mind. So research to me, um, as a scientist, I often think of it as being very, well, scientific, um, but really research in a more general sense is just a systematic inquiry involving the collection, the documentation, analysis, and interpretation of this information, and we use that to evaluate the validity of a hypothesis or to give yourself a pool of knowledge to critically evaluate others' conclusions or other people's data. Um, in every regard, research is important for a few specific reasons, in my opinion. First, I think it forces us to take a step back um, and analyze information objectively and then draw our own conclusions. I see a lot, both in science and also outside of this, a lot in the occult communities especially, um, we're fed different hypotheses or theories or UPG, which is unverified personal gnosis, um, as fact or as something that has like historical or even some scientific basis behind it. But that might not necessarily be true. And being able to look at the data or the arguments yourself and critically think about what's being said is so crucial to having a well-researched and well-informed opinion and conclusion. Um, Kind of going along with that, having all of this information at your fingertips because of the research that you've done allows you to catch misinformation, which I think in the occult community is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, if someone has said something about a topic that goes against kind of the majority of well-established research, then it should send up a red flag. Um, and if you didn't have that body of knowledge due to the research, you wouldn't know it and you might continue to spread that misinformation. So not only is it good for you to establish your own kind of um, basis of knowledge, but it's also good so we can hold everybody in our community accountable as well to make sure that we're spreading the correct kind of information. And finally, this is the one that I think is the most fun and is the reason that I personally really enjoy research. It opens the doors to new, unique perspectives. We have our own opinions, and these are formulated a lot of times by our own experiences and things that we've read other places. But as we read and listen to other people speak on both similar and different topics, you'll find things that work for, that work for you and others that don't. And over time, as you continue to do more research, you might start kind of picking and choosing from the different areas to create a very unique practice or set of beliefs that fits you more than any one particular belief did in itself. And I think that's both very beautiful and very empowering. Yeah, so when, we, when we're thinking about research, um, I guess it's important to kind of differentiate between the types because um, in the kind of occult world, we might be um, more accustomed to looking at qualitative research. So that's sort of looking at the qualities of things, um, understanding their physiognomy and their, their nature. Um, and might not always be empirically measurable. In the scientific realm, though, 
often things are more in the kind of quantitative realm. So these are specific numerical qualities that we can measure um, and we can look at changes over time um, with that kind of data. Now, it's not hard and fast. Some science is qualitative and social sciences will also use um, quantitative data. But that um, kind of differentiation is um, kind of one of the real ways in, in which the, um, the science diverge. But we can still apply, uh, we can still apply the same kind of principles to our research in each realm. Um, a particularly important part of scientific research is hypothesis testing. So when you're when you're doing an experiment, you're setting up a hypothesis to test, um, and you're measuring certain qualities in order to test the hypothesis. When you're designing a system, you want a control to inform how the system shows you an expected effect, so a positive control, or um, a negative effect, so an, a negative control. And what this does is allows you to statistically test whether it works or not. Um, it kind of sounds very complicated, but as you can kind of see, it's something that could very easily cross over to your occult practice if you wanted. Yeah, so this is, this is all pretty much from what research has been covered pretty much in great detail uh, by the two before me. Uh, I come from a, a much less scientific background, and my approach to research is very interesting in that I come from an artistic and historical background and the arts while I love the arts <laughs> uh, when I jumped from like an art essay writing class to say a historical essay writing class I noticed that their methodologies for research were drastically different which caused for some sort of strangeness when I began to actually learn how to properly research something so to me, just at its very basis, research, quality research that is, is an in-depth study of a certain topic and it can be very niche. So it could be something like I read an essay on one epithet, which is like a title of a deity, usually a deity, uh, one epithet found on a single statue in a single town in Attica, which is where Athens is located in classical Greece, or it could be uh, much broader, like a study of a series of epithets found across multiple statues, pottery, writing in Attica and beyond. Um, and so it's what's interesting looking at research from a historical and artistic perspective is that controls don't necessarily apply in the sense that we think of in more a scientific setting. It's more about comparing and contrasting various primary sources and sometimes secondary sources, but usually primary sources and drawing a certain conclusion. Ideally, the more primary sources one can gather, the better your conclusion will be, followed, of course, by secondary and tertiary sources. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, art is significantly more difficult, specifically when we're talking about like art history, which, you know, a lot of early occult studies, like in classical Greece, is a lot of it is based in pottery. Um, and it, it becomes a, a bit more difficult because a lot of it is based on opinion, either historical opinion or contemporaneous opinion or modern opinion. And then these opinions thus must be assessed in the context in which they were written. So is this author coming from a certain privileged background? And how does this affect the opinions and facts they are generating? Like there was a notorious art critic of, uh, I want, I, I will go back and, and, and check on who and when it was written. I believe it was the 19th century said, like, there have been no wow. great female artists. <laughs> now, this person, yeah. So, of course, though, what they had, what they didn't keep in mind as well, were women artists allowed to do certain things, and obviously they were going to be tossed aside for certain other artists. So, in history and specifically art as well, examining the context of the research is almost as important as the actual thing that you're looking at. This kind of gets on to what we were going to talk about next, but could you explain what you mean by primary and secondary sources um, and how you can identify those? Right. Right. Um, so again, I'm coming from this from a, a more artistic background, so 
and no one, no, no one get up in arms if I, if I say this wrong, but how I have learned to view, so primary sources would be, for example, like a piece of pottery mm-hmm. from Greece depicting a myth. That would be a primary source. And a secondary source would be someone writing about gotcha, okay. a primary okay. source specifically. Um, yes. And then tertiary sources is someone writing about someone writing about a primary source. Yeah, actually, I can touch upon that a little, take it even a little further. Um, I totally agree with those definitions. Um, I think they're they're absolutely accurate. Um, kind of like Fels said, the primary source is like the records or evidence or a particular right. item from like a particular event, right? Um, and it can take a lot of different forms, pottery, poetry, photographs, diaries, personal memos, anything um, that's happening at a particular instance being right. written by that particular person. In the occult community, from the things that I've read, the things that I consider to be primary sources would be something like the Corpus Hermeticum, um, the original writings from the right. Thrice yeah, Great yeah. Hermes, the Greek magical papyri, I yeah. think is also was something that would be considered a primary source, um, the Emerald Tablet, all of those would be considered primary sources within our particular community. Um, and then a secondary source, a lot of... In the occult community, I think of secondary sources more of like an interpretation of the primary sources or someone's analysis of a primary source. I think a lot of like historical reviews of the occult would be considered secondary sources. For example, at the current moment, um, I'm reading a book called The Quest of Hermes Trimegistus by Gary Lackman. And it's all about kind of his perspective and summary of who the thrice great Hermes is based off of or who the thrice great Hermes is. And it's based off of a lot of primary sources, like the stories that were written down and passed down through generations um, and mythologies recorded as far back, you know, from ancient Egypt. So that to me is a um, interpretation and a collective summary of a bunch of information from primary sources, which is what classifies it as secondary. And then kind of this, I don't know how you all would define tertiary sources, but to me, a tertiary source is any, it's like a compendium of other sources. <laughs> so it's typically like an encyclopedia of sorts. Um, an example that comes to mind immediately to me is Cunningham's Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs. I would consider that to be a tertiary source because it pulls from a bunch of other sources that talk about the both um, physical properties of these herbs and also the magical properties of these herbs. I mean, kind of a collective reference right. that you can I, go back to if you ever too- forgot. Probably a, a vast majority. Not, that's not necessarily true. I would say things like like a lot of Llewellyn books, for example. A lot of them, like the, um, they have like a lot of encyclopedia-esque things. I would consider those to be tertiary sources or even a lot of occult writings where it's not like immediately apparent like, if the, especially the more broad the subject, I feel like the more kind of like a tertiary source it tends to be, if that makes sense at all. <laughs> yeah. I would agree with that. I think, I know Lou Wallen has like a couple of like the, Lou Wallen's right, big book right, right, of right. correspondences, ceremonial magic. Um, I think there's one of runes, so on and so forth. I would certainly consider right. those more of a tertiary source than anything else. Um, and I would consider a lot of occult books written based on I guess opinion and like yeah. UPG I would also kind of consider those tertiary sources um because they're not always in fact many and I think um we'll talk about this a little bit a little later on but a lot of like witchy oh. books don't yep. actually sort yep. like don't actually go into cite later. Yeah. primary sources <laughs> and so because of that I totally don't feel yeah. comfortable claiming that it's a secondary Maybe. source <laughs> um, we'll, we'll touch on that later We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, so let's move on and let's talk about, we already talked about the categories of sources, so good on us for doing that. Uh, let's move forward on how do you vet a particular source that you are either reading or watching or um, analyzing in some particular way? Um, so I'm a, I'm a scientist, as I, uh, you already know. Um, so I find it actually a little bit harder to vet occult sources than I do scientific ones. Um, just because of my training isn't necessarily geared towards the social sciences, like Fell is. Um, and the work I do is kind of more quantitative. But the variability is still interesting to consider. 
uh, my sibling is a historian um, and you should have seen the group chat because the messages were just coming in saying everything is an opinion, objectivity is completely impossible, facts are a lie. Um, my, other, my other sister is also um, a philosopher, so um, she was chiming in saying, yeah, you, got, you can't believe anything <laughs> in history. And obviously this is hyperbole, but I think it brings up an important point that Fell alluded to earlier. Even in historical sources, we're always looking at it from somebody's perspective. So what we need to think about is the historiography. When was it written? Who wrote it? Um, and what was their status? So that not only refers to their status in society, things like privilege, but also their status in occult groups. Were they well respected? What, who did they associate with? Who did they come in contact with? Quite a lot of um, people um, in occult realms, um, people like Alistair Crowley, for example, they traveled quite a lot. So they had a lot of, lots of exposure to lots of different groups. Um, so you can look at what sources they drew upon. And talking about sources, you can also think about looking at bibliographies. So that can be really, really helpful if the uh, sources cite, actually cite things properly, which uh, can, be, can be a bit tenuous. Um, but if, if things are cited, it's really helpful because then you can understand the perspective of the writer and kind of start to deconstruct their evidence base, deconstruct the biases, actually look at whether you think they've interpreted the evidence correctly or not. Um, and another important caveat to this, I think, is privilege and power, because a lot of the time there's a focus on going back to um, kind of original sources, written sources. Um, and while that's great, I think it's really great to have historically kind of verified stuff and things like the PGM are really useful. There is um, an inherent bias to that. Um, historians refer to this as the kind of authorized heritage discourse. And what this basically means is that people who are in power would give us more written and material sources. Um, and there are certain traditions which are more likely to be passed down orally or that have been lost because the people um, who are practicing those traditions may not have um, had the power to uh, preserve their inheritance. Even things like artifacts from the time might have been misinterpreted um, from people um, in, in power. Um, and you may even find that there are civilizations like the Celts who are kind of misrepresented because we only have perspective on them from um, another civilization. So do keep bibliographies in mind, but also think about oral transmission. Think about attending conferences and think about actually talking to other people who maybe practice those traditions because um, you can learn a lot um, that's not just written down historically. A history isn't a democratic proce process. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I'm, I'm in full agreement with you here. Uh, the historiography, which is the study of sort of history itself and how it's sort of compiled, is paramount. So as you mentioned, your, your sibling said, nothing, no matter how objective it is, is still, it's written by a human with biases and opinions and nothing that we write or create is created in a vacuum. Historians build upon previous historians who have their own cultural biases, and this is especially true in the occult. For example, there are many historical uh, or anthropological studies, quote unquote, uh, that are often cited still to this day, that even, even if we now know they are largely falsified. For example, Robert Graves and his uh, work on sort of, oh, I forgot to bring, I'll come back to him. Forgot what he wrote. <laughs> I'll come back to him. But um, Margaret Murray, oh, Margaret Murray. <laughs> she is infamous for her work on what she called the witch cult of Europe. And specifically she created the archetype of the horned God, which she sort of pulled from various other cultures that do exist and she basically had this idea that there was this unbroken witch cult dating back to pre-christian times in europe um specifically like over in like england and kind of dipping into france but mostly that general region and i still see her work quoted and i'm like why so margaret murray for those who don't know was an egyptologist Working in the yes, so she is very much not a uh, not a writer on middle medieval Europe or before 
and a lot of her sources were based on a bunch of nonsense. Like, her primary sources were, like, a fiction novel written in, like, 1741. Yeah, 1741. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Which is why you so, biographies, everyone. <laughs> Yes. So Margaret Murray did a lot of her work in the 20th century, and she was influenced by another person who was also often quoted, uh, James Fraser, who wrote The Golden Bough. So, and a lot of this stuff can be viewed with an interesting lens of, like, The Golden Bough, for example, can be looked at as a work of fiction. It can be looked at as a, an interesting... I, like, I think you could get into, like, there's a whole concept of pop culture witches where they're very much working with things that are not based in history. And there is, like, archetypes that are useful in the Golden Bough, for example. However, it was not a... It should not be viewed as a historical source and should not be used as, like, a primary source. Ah, here I find out what Robert Graves wrote. Robert Graves wrote The White Goddess which a lot of people will use as a sort of secondary source. And he sort of added a lot of the things of like the mother goddess and the triple goddess, uh, which we now know to be based in these two who there is obviously evidence of three formed deities, but the, uh, the whole Wiccan idea of the triple formed goddess is uh, largely based in the 20th century and the 19th century. So that's why sources are extremely important. And even <laughs> when we're pulling away from sort of witchcraft and looking more into like more like older cultural religions, like Hellenism, for example, a lot of texts from Hellenic, you know, like Hellenic studies are, were originally written by aristocratic white male Victorian English perspective, <laughs> which is oftentimes very problematic in that there were things that they deemed to be taboo. Just for example, the sort of the homosexuality in ancient Greece at the time or the way that the ancient Greeks viewed sexuality and gender, which we now know to be, at least outside of Athens, to be a lot more fluid than people would normally believe. And a lot of that was sort of rewritten or they would sort of draw wild conclusions to sort of pretend that they didn't exist. So a lot of times I like, even for example, now, like when I'm, I'm reading the Iliad and the version that I'm reading was originally translated in 1890. So while I'm reading it, I have to keep in mind that the person who translated this had all of the cultural influences of that society at the time. And there could be things that are written in there or translated that are not actually how the translation it would be written or read today. Um, yeah, that's a really so the first good thing point, I actually, yeah, 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 I was just thinking about like Orphic hymns, for example. You can look at translations for Orphic hymns if you don't choose to read it in Greek, and you can find things that sound like actually quite different hymns depending on which translation you yeah. use. And it's the same thing with the PGM. People like to cite it as a really useful primary source, and it is, but you have to assume that it was translated well. Um, because those things could actually mean sort of vastly different things, um, depending right. on the authors who interpreted it. So it's just really important to keep that in mind. I think it's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I can touch on this even further. Um, I'm running into the same issue with reading the Corpus Hermeticum right now, because I'm reading a translation of it. Um, obviously, I can't get my hands on the original copy, which is so unfortunate. I so wish I could. Um, but you do have to keep in mind that this was translated um, not only from the ancient like Hebrew text right, to right. into Greek, but then also from Greek to Latin. Both of the time periods in which they were done are going to have an influence upon the translation. And so that's something that you definitely have to keep in like mind when you're actually reading this particular translation is the culture from whence it was translated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so basically when I am vetting sources Literally, the first thing I look at is a bibliography. It's gotten to the point now, <laughs> if anyone recommends me a like witchy or occult book, the first thing I go is to go towards the back. I go to the back and I see what their sources are because of, yeah, because of all of this. And it's hard too because, yes, as Henny mentioned, the there's a lot of traditions that are written or were not, that weren't written down and were transmitted orally 
So it, it becomes, sometimes you have to make concessions where you're not always able to see the amount of primary or secondary sources, usually primary, primary sources that you would like to see because, like for example with Appalachian folk magic, a lot of that is transmitted orally and isn't written down, so it can be really, really difficult to vet those sources, and in some ways you, you do have to make concessions and be like, okay, well, it doesn't have as much primary sources as I would like, but this person comes from XYZ background and sort of in some ways trusting the process to uh, can be be very difficult but i find sourcing to be one of the biggest issues in the occult community i could go on endlessly about about that I think so. yeah i touching upon your mention of making concessions with traditions that are more orally based I think in that particular case, it comes down to finding people who are considered experts in that particular tradition and going to them with the information and asking if it's accurate. Um, The people who practice those traditions, they practice it, not to say that if you don't practice it in a more traditional manner that you aren't capable of verifying information, but I do think that if you truly want to know whether something is substantiated or not, you need to go back to the experts, the people who have been practicing this for so long or are practicing it in their native area where they are kind of more connected to the practice as a whole. Um, And then have them also like help you vet your resources. There is no shame in asking somebody who's a part of a particular practice to say, Hey, I read this. Is this accurate? And from what you know, and your experience, I think it opens a great dialogue and there's nothing wrong with starting that dialogue and being critical thinkers within the occult community. In fact, I think we could do more of that rather than just like randomly suggesting or making suggestions about things when we haven't fully um, vetted them ourselves. Yeah, and the benefit of the internet as well is that um, we can we can go to more places, we can read more things, and we can um, contact more people. So this weekend I actually attended um, a conference and it was on um, Scottish folklore and traditions. So um, I'm from England, but I live in Scotland right now. And um, there's actually not as much Scottish folklore written down as you'd expect. Um, certainly, lots of Celtic knowledge has been lost. So it was really interesting for me to actually just go to the, the conference, sit down, listen to people's stories, listen to people's perspectives, um, and just kind of immerse myself in that um, to get a better a better sense of um, the, the things that are actually being passed down in those communities. Now, it's obviously not going to be available for everybody, but I think I thought it was a really nice way of um, getting a a bit more perspective without having to uh, dig your way through dodgily sourced books, if you like. Right. Um, What's also interesting, specifically, this made me think of think of it talking about sort of like Scottish folklore. Um, We when we look at like historical music, for example, um, I guess as a side note, I don't remember if I brought this up last time, but I, I also do historical music because I just I don't know. I love it. What's interesting about historical music uh, is so, for example, uh, Francis, what was his name? Francis James Child, who composed, or not composed, but he compiled and anthologized a lot of uh, English and Scottish tunes. He actually got some of them by going to America because what was interesting is there was this sort of crossover where a lot of ballads and tunes survived in America and were like passed down and written down when they had sort of gone away in Scotland and England. So there's sort of also interesting parts when you you can look at looking at different sources is you can see where there might have been crossover with a different culture. And there is like a lot of um just ideas that we rediscovered because one culture preserved them. I mean that's evidence of so much of what we have on ancient Greece or classical Athens is the reason we have a lot of it is because it was preserved in Arabic. (laughs) And then in the Renaissance, it was sort of retranslated because these things would have been lost had they not been saved by one particular culture. So that's another interesting thing to note is that sometimes when there's uh, interactions between cultures, even if a source, not source, I guess uh, an aspect is sort of erased or forgotten, in one culture, sometimes a culture that they had interactions with has evidence of that. That's really fascinating. Yes. Uh, speaking about vetting sources, so like I said, I 
I personally feel that one of the biggest problems in the occult community is sourcing. And this came up like a few weeks ago. I was literally just laying in bed and suddenly I was like, wait, what the heck is moon water? <laughs> and like moon water is one of almost like if you Google like modern witchcraft, it's one of the most talked about things. So for anyone who a meme, doesn't know, and I love it, but it is, it is genuinely it's a meme. Such a meme. Yeah. For those of you who don't know or don't feel like Googling, I guess, the basic idea of moon water, and this extends to like sun water, etc., is you like leave water out during a full moon or a new moon to like imbue it with its energy. That's the basic idea of moon water. And what's interesting is this is something like I've been a pagan for quite quite a while, so I've heard this over and over and over again. And I never stopped to consider, wait, where does this where does this come from? And so I was doing quite a, quite a bit of research, like obviously not a lot of scholarly, like I wasn't sitting down and spending hours interviewing people, uh, but it was a few hours perusing the internet. And I found literally zero <laughs> primary sources on moon water or any, <laughs> I didn't even find any secondary sources on moon water. The only reference I could find when like, going on some random blog is a bunch of people mentioned this book, uh, The Golden Wheel Dream Book and Fortune Tellers, uh, written by Felix Fontaine, published in 1862. And they kept quoting this one spell, which said, uh, the following substances must be gathered in silence when the full moon is in the heavens. You gather a bunch of things. Uh, all these things you must place in a vessel, then pour upon them 595 drops of clear Easter water and place the vessel over the fire. Or what is better still, over a spirit lamp. So is the moon a spirit lamp, or what? Like, I don't know what a spirit lamp is, but um, <laughs> so yeah, it's like uh, people kept quoting this. I'm like, nowhere does they say to chart like nowhere does it say what we now know of as moon water, where it's you charge your water under like it's just as it's more like the full moon itself is charging the whole ritual, and not just the water because I mean it says Easter water which I probably is some sort of holy water. I might, I might guess it's holy water made on Easter. So that's like the only reference that people kept giving. And I was like, that's not, it's not even talking about that. Um, so I was, it just got me thinking that there are so many things in modern witchcraft that even in our modern day and age and with the internet, there's just, it's almost like, there are so myth, so much writing that is impossible to figure out or possible to trace. You can almost see where it comes from because you can think of lustral water in general. Like in Catholicism, right. you have holy water. In um, Hellenist, Hellenism, you have um, kernips, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Right. Um, but it's something that you use for purification before rituals. Lots and lots of cultures have purification water. So I. I can kind of see where it comes from, and in that sense, I, I can see why people wouldn't question it. But you bring up such a good point that, yeah, we, some of these things we just don't think about, we don't think to source, but actually, yeah, maybe they don't have a historical basis. Did they need to have a historical basis? Maybe not, but it's still definitely good to be critical about it. Yeah, I, th I, just, I just think it's absolutely fascinating. And one of the other ones that I was going down more, and I don't know, maybe I'll touch on it at some other point, but another thing that I really wanted to look at was astral projection and i don't mean soul traveling i mean specifically the term astral projection i actually struggled to find a lot of I, and this gets complicated because there's like a lot of soul traveling and a lot of various cultures but i was specifically trying to trace the history of that exact phrase astral projection and i was finding it actually quite difficult um and i think there's a lot of like weird like bouncing around of secondary and tertiary sources in sort of books that talk about it. And I couldn't find any, like I found a lot of scientific quote unquote, I guess some of them, I don't know how scientific they are, but I found a lot of <laughs> studies looking at astral projection and trying to see how valid it is. Um, but I, I wanted an anthropological study on it and I couldn't find any anthropological studies in like the keywords that I was using. So that was something that I was sort of, Keep in mind, if anyone if anyone has or finds an ast or anthropological study on astral projection, I would love to see it because that is I, another I would also thing. Be interested. <laughs> I feel like, and this could be 
incredibly wrong. I will fully acknowledge that I have done little to no research on this particular topic. But I do think that the term astral projection is something that has come about because of new age um, like practice. I don't think that astral projection was called that or thought of in the same way in kind of more ancient traditions. Um, in fact, I think kind of the equivalent to the astral realm would be kind of what we would consider like the causal realm or the, um, in hermeticism, it would be like the mind of the cosmos, which is um, kind of the one step above the the physical reality, which we just call the cosmos. Uh, so I think that's kind of maybe where it comes from, but I do think that the term astral, the astral realm and astral production is much more of a new age concept. Um, if I'm wrong, if someone please correct me, um, I would be so grateful for resources on that. But um, you bring up a really good point, and this is a whole other topic entirely. I'm only going to touch upon it briefly, uh, but that's another thing that I, I think is is very interesting that a lot of people don't realize in modern witchcraft. There is modern witchcraft and New Ageism used to be pretty distinct, and now there's a lot of things that have gotten blended together in I think a way that can be a bit strange. And I think you're definitely right. The term and a lot of the usage of astral projection in the astral realm comes from the new age culture. So that's, again, that goes back to sourcing <laughs> where people sort of see one thing. And I, and I think it's fine to like use things and, and blend practices, but I think people will like look at that and be like, Oh, that's witchcraft. That's modern, whatever it's modern witchcraft. And they don't realize that it sort of came from this other place and sort of the cultural influences of that particular uh, movement, I guess. Yeah, I think we need to be really cognizant of the origins of certain practices, especially if we blend them together. And this touches upon something else that we won't get into, but the idea of like cultural appropriation, right? So you, you have a very common practice now, but it's really a blend of maybe practices that came from closed traditions that shouldn't be practiced by somebody outside of those traditions but you wouldn't know that unless you went back and looked at the origin which is part of the reason why this research is so important for both yourself and that spread of misinformation um, and ensuring the practices you're taking a part of are you know okay for you to do so um, because if you do want, want to respect closed practices I would hope that everybody kind of agrees in that yeah, absolutely that you know regard but um Okay, so we can move on from here and talk about, we can expand upon what we've already been talking about um, and discuss the variability in the sources that you learn from. What benefits are there to having a variety of sources? Are there issues with having so many sources that you fail to maybe put things together because you're too far spread? I can kind of start because I have a strong opinion <laughs> on this particular I believe that the more variety you have in your sources, the better. And some would disagree with me, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but each each source, especially within the occult community, is opinion. Well-researched, perhaps, and this is referencing secondary and tertiary sources, not primary. Um, Well-researched, perhaps, yes, you would always need to check that yourself. But a lot of the times, it's an opinion, nonetheless, or conclusions drawn based upon people's opinions, their unverified personal gnosis, and their experiences. If you only read one author, then you're only going to be exposed to one perspective. And it's crucial to study a variety or read multiple authors within one category, even within just one singular category, to get a true taste of the differences in application and viewpoints. And kind of on a similar note, um, don't just limit your research to things focused specifically within the witchy realm. I hear a lot of new practitioners, you know, say, what are some witchy books that I can read? Or what book should I read to get started on my witchy journey? And I see this a lot more with kind of green witchcraft than I do kind of with some of the other parts of witchcraft. But if you're interested in, you know, alchemy and look at chemistry, if you're interested in green witchcraft or herbalism, look into gardening and homeopathic remedies. Mundane resources are equally, if not more, valuable than the you know, witchy resources. It gives you it gives you not only the ability to help determine what is mundane and what is magical, as we touched upon in our first episode, but it also gives you the foundational knowledge to build upon the foundational knowledge 
to which you build upon kind of the magical knowledge. And you can bring the two together much more easily if you have both. Um, even something as simple as meditation, right, has perspectives from, you know, many different practices and religions. And being able to, having read and researched all of kind of the different ways to do it, you might find one resonates with you more than another. And it doesn't have to be labeled as meditation. Mindfulness is another term for that. I mean, there's there's different ways of saying kind of the same thing in different practices and religions. And you'll get a more expansive kind of idea of what it is if you read a larger variety of sources. I, th- I think I, I agree. I, I think variety is definitely good. Um, but don't confuse diversifying your sources with uncritically reading and just picking up everything. First of all, you'll get overwhelmed with bored. Secondly, you should still be applying a kind of critical eye. So that means looking at things um, like considering the historiography, like we mentioned. Unfortunately, um, if you're particularly if you're in the uh, Hellenist realm, like myself and Fella, um, classics is still quite um, male dominated, elite dominated. So. If you can find sources that aren't written by white cishet, cishet men, you have um, done yourself a favor. Um, but looking to different fields as well, like Astra mentioned, um, just make sure that you're still applying those key principles of um, cross-referencing in your information, cross-referencing the correspondences, for example, um, looking at the interactions um, of the authors with the communities that they're talking about. All of those things will help you to deconstruct the sources. Um, so you're diversifying your reading but you're doing so in a kind of a sensible way yeah with uh, the the whole idea of diversifying sources is i mean i it's it's so important not to read from obviously just just one source um but i, I think a lot of times people will they tend to like if they see something that they disagree with they sometimes will throw the whole source away now this obviously does not apply to extreme cases like uh fascism (laughs) or racism um those things i think i think it is okay to say this is not a relatable or not relatable this is not a a usable source but i think sometimes for less like if it's just like a disagreement of opinion i think it's okay to sort of pick from that source and pick what is useful. So Thorne Mooney, who is a pretty prolific uh, Wiccan writer with, yes, with Leigh Whelan, and she writes her own books, and she's also a witch tuber. She posts really thoughtful, uh, really thought-provoking YouTube videos. I highly recommend her. Um, One of her videos was about why she reads bad books. And the general idea was that besides that you can actually glean useful information from less than ideal sources is that it also informs you on the different views and perspectives that are currently existing in the community, as well as allows you to better formulate why you think these sources are of poor quality. So this isn't to say that you should constantly consume bad information or read something that is actively harmful, like I mentioned. Um, But if you want to form a sure opinion on something, it helps to read it and analyze it like for example it's hard to have an opinion on a certain writer if you've never read their work now you don't have to necessarily read their book cover to cover and take notes if you don't enjoy it (laughs) but it's it's there's a difference between just sort of jumping on the bandwagon and saying no this person sucks i hate their writing um versus like acknowledging that well this part's useful uh this part is is not useful um, and I mentioned this earlier, I didn't actually get to it, but I wrote down that one of the, the important things when I'm vetting sources is, um, <clears throat> oh, now I've lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, yes, is it, is sort of identifying, uh, like getting, f- being familiarized with sources that are notorious for being false, <laughs> like Margaret Murray versus familiarizing with sources that are often accepted to be more factual or more credible, I should say, more credible. So I think familiarizing yourself with these sort of like textbooks or 
intro or not intro, but books that are fundamental to a certain practice can help you then better identify like, oh, well, this part's useful. This part's not. Um, it helps you look at a source more critically. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think it all like everything you just said ties back to ensuring that like we as practitioners are well informed and have come to their own have come to our own conclusions because to this effort you have to read all sides even if you disagree with one um you can't just decide not to read it or to only read the ones that you're biased towards there's always two you know or more sides to every story and to really have a well-drawn and critically evaluated conclusion we have to both read and listen to all sides within reason, of course. Again, like Fel said, you know, fascism and racism, please don't read anything with that in it. Um, but again, we ha- you really truly need to have kind of a big picture thought process going on when it comes to reading sources. Because if you limit your scope, then you're doing nothing really to benefit yourself. In fact, in my opinion, you would be harming your abilities to kind of get a broader overview of the particular topic. One thing that we haven't touched upon yet in this particular episode and something that I think we should talk about are sources on the internet. So blogs, YouTube, um, Discord servers, information within there. What are your thoughts on these sources, their reliability, how you vet them, um, and any other things? Um, Blogs? There are blogs that I really like. Um, and the key to me liking them is really them having a bibliography that I can look up. Um, in terms of Hellenism, there's one called Bearing the Aegis. I'm not sure what Fel thinks of this, but that one in particular tends to be quite well referenced. So you can always go back to um, their, so- their sources and see. They, they have quite a reconstructionist perspective, but at least you can kind of see where it's coming from. Whereas not all blogs, I think, will be the same quality. Some of them will just be sharing unverified personal notices. And I think as sure as long as you know that that's what's being shared that's fine but you should always make sure that you're not under the impression that what's being shared is kind of more of a historical or widespread um practice i guess yeah i think one of the important things is is uh reputation amongst the sort of community so for example the blog that Henny mentioned I I have referenced her blog quite a bit and she is extraordinarily like thorough with her sources but it's also important to keep in mind like I have heard some people who disagree with her so it's important to always use something like no one is a hero like they're not all gonna be perfect or have opinions that you agree with but I tend to if someone I see keeps coming up I will look through their blog sort of see what I do with books just sort of see what their sourcing is and sort of how they are viewed by the occult community. If it's a resounding, this person writes nonsense, well, then I'm going to look at their work a bit differently. But if it's sort of, if they're frequently referenced, I will be like, okay, maybe this person has has merit to them, especially if they have sources. Sources always, <laughs> always makes me happy to see. <laughs> I do want to touch upon briefly, though, that popularity does not equate a good source. Um, I see this a lot more in the YouTube community than anything else in particular. Um, People will see a video that has, you know, hundreds of thousands of views or likes, you know, or whatever, and assume that because of this, they know what they're talking about and that they are a good resource. That's not to say that YouTubers who have, you know, incredible views are a bad resource, but I definitely think that you have to be a little more wary um, there and really vet them as people. Look them up online, look at their interactions, see if they've written anything, and if they have, read that. Do maybe get um, other occultist opinion on this particular person within your within the community and see what they think. It is equally as important, in my opinion, to vet people authors you know so on and so forth as it is the information contained within what they're presenting um because information being presented from somebody who maybe doesn't have the best reputation um is probably not the information that you want to be basing 
any research off of. So just be cognizant of that. Um, don't be afraid to research the people in addition to the information. Um, as somebody who, you know, hopes to publish scientific papers in the future, the last thing I want is somebody to accept everything that I say as fact. The, the criticism is welcome. And I don't think anybody who has published anything would be remiss as to suggest that you accept what they say as fact. That might be a little... Um, Maybe, maybe too positive <laughs> in terms of thinking that everybody does things the right way. But um, I think you'll find that most authors hold that, that idea um, of not having any issue with being vetted themselves um, by other people just to ensure that they have, you know, good information. Um, but I was just reading this blog by Kelly Steed recently, who is another um, kind of Hellenistic based blogger. And something that they were saying was that different um, online communities in particular can have quite divergent opinions on things. So, for example, um, they were saying in the blogger community, you tend to have there's more references to miasma, which, if you don't know, is um, something, a state of sort of ritual impurity that you try and get rid of to get yourself in the right mindset for a ritual. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's a sort of overview. Um, whereas they might use um, the word, I think, Lyra in the kind of Tumblr blogging community, which I don't know anything about. But what I'm trying to get at is that you might need to not only diversify your sources, but diversify the communities you expose yourself to if you're trying to vet the reputation of these people, because they might be quite different depending just on the sort of weird microcosms you find online. Um, and, you know, how people get popular in sort of the social media age is not always based on the information they're sharing, but um, also about the way they communicate. So I guess that's just an interesting thing that I saw recently that might be important to keep in mind. All right. Well, that concludes this episode of Test Tubes and Cauldrons. We hope you enjoyed our discussion about the magic of research, um, sources, how to vet sources, the kind of sources that we often reference within our own practice. We will see you next week for our next episode, which is going to be scientific, um, more scientific than this one at least, which is kind of fell more into the realm of the occult. And we're excited to have you join us then. Bye, everyone. Have a good day.